but So thank you all for coming this evening. I'd just like to begin with a few announcements. And um, if, you can, if you survive this lecture, then tomorrow, um, tomorrow morning, we have a tour in Hebrew um, throughout the old city of Jerusalem. And uh, the tour is on um, Hasmonean Jerusalem, Jerusalem of the Maccabees, how Jerusalem uh, changes and develops uh, thanks in part to the um, establishment of a semi-independent and later a fully independent Jewish entity and uh, the ideology of the uh, Maccabees and their descendants. And uh, it's quite an interesting tour that takes in um, sites uh, around the Jewish quarter, uh, especially, and um, perhaps even um, looking at the um, Hasmonean extension of the Temple Mount. We did this a few weeks ago in English, but this one will be uh, in Hebrew. And if you'd like more information, then just please see a staff member after this talk. And also like to remind folks that on the 22nd uh, in the evening, we have an Israeli group uh, serenading us with Christmas carols, and that's a free concert. And um, then finally on the 24th, it's open house. We'll begin um, worshiping the Lord and uh, having cookies as well at 5 p.m. And uh, somewhere around 10, 15 or so, we will stop. And then we will have nine lessons and carols and will be fo followed by Holy Communion. And um, on Sunday morning, we have services here at 10.30. There will be no evening, Sunday evening service. So for those of you who sometimes come along in the evening, uh, this is a, hopefully this is a, fore, a forewarning. There are a number of other activities uh, planned during the Christmas season. So please um, take a, a flyer or leaflet. And, um, and if you don't, want to be responsible for murdering a tree, then all of this information is online and it's on Facebook. Well, let's begin. And um, our discussion or subject this evening is uh, the um, heritage, you might say, of Hanukkah and the, and the history of the church. I'd like to say just from the beginning, um, almost every year we've talked about the relationship between Hanukkah and the period uh, known as the Hasmonean, the Hasmonean period uh, and its influence on the New Testament or its uh, um, importance for the New Testament. And I'm not gonna be doing that uh, this evening. Uh, instead, I'd like to look at a, the uh, contribution, you might say, or the use of um, the, the uh, story of the Maccabees and how it's played out uh, in the history uh, of the church. And when I started, I thought, well, there's not really a lot to this subject, but uh, getting stuck into it after a little, after a bit, I discovered that it's uh, actually quite, uh, quite huge. And uh, I don't want to pretend that this lecture will even, will do nothing more than scratch the, scratch the surface. Um, 
Where do we want to begin? I'd like to begin with um, a myth or a misconception or a misunderstanding. And it's quite popular here in Jerusalem, but uh, it is also um, a uh, well-worn myth or misunderstanding in uh, many circles that uh, are related to Christ Church. And that is the, very simply that the church, especially the traditional church, uh, rejected or threw out its Jewish roots. It cut itself off from um, the soil of Israel. Uh, it came under the influence of uh, Hellenism and philosophy and, and uh, many other isms. And it's taking us, taken us far away, yes, from the core uh, of the Jewish gospel. Well, I don't believe that. I believe that, yes, on one hand, there was some rejection of our Jewish roots, especially when it came to holidays or dietary laws, um, circumcision, for example, all things that, were, that, gave, get, that gave and still give Jewish people an identity. Replacement theology, certainly. But on the other hand, right, the church, even though it doesn't want to always acknowledge it, the church is Jewish. And basically all that we do, or at least the core of all that we do, and all that we believe, yes, comes to us from, the, from, the, from Judaism of the Second Temple period and beyond, right? Our philosophy, our theology, our belief in the one God who makes heaven and earth, a God who's not part of his creation, yes, who's separate from his creation, a God who loves, a God who's merciful, a God who wants to redeem and to restore because we're fallen, a God who has, um, who, who, who promises to send this Redeemer, a Messiah, the Holy Spirit, yes, inspired in sacred scripture, and more, yes. And the values uh, that come out, yes, of those scriptures, right? Care for the poor, mercy, care for the sick, the command uh, to be generous, the um, command to be to for um, to practice uh, morality, sexual morality, the call to holiness, to imitate God and to be like Him. All of those values are biblical values that we really understood the way that they were put into practice by the Jewish people. And of course, what about life, community life, praying, preaching, anointing people with oil, uh, the concept of ordination, um, bread and wine, baptism, all of, again, all of these things that we take for granted, we're indebted to the Jewish people. And so yes, there's a lot of anti-Semitism in the church. There's a lot of uh, ignorance. There is a lot of ingratitude uh, to, to the Jewish people. But still, uh, try as hard as we may, and with, with a few exceptions, we cannot, right, de-Judaize. We cannot cut ourselves off from our Jewish roots. And uh, I think Hanukkah is a good, a good example of this. We know in the Gospel of John that Jesus does, um, he's here in Jerusalem uh, at the time of Hanukkah. We could spend some time looking at the book of Hebrews, especially Hebrews 11, uh, to understand uh, endurance, yes, 
um, facing discipline. The um, the suffering that uh, that the, the saints or the faithful have to have to uh, undergo, but I don't think um, I don't think that uh, actually maybe well actually won't help us very much because what I'd like to do is to look at just for a moment uh, so, uh, a Jewish understanding. And to see how that Jewish understanding and that Jewish dilemma over Hanukkah is actually married, mirrored, right, in the Christian tradition as well. And so we all know Hanukkah today. It's a kid's holiday in Israel. It's a holiday about the, um, the oil in the temple. It's a holiday in which people eat uh, jelly donuts, uh, which are very fattening, and apparently a really big sufganiya with the cream on top and not just the cream in the middle can be a thousand calories. So all of that is, um, I think, well known to us. But uh, I'm not sure that many of us uh, realize that the story of the candles, and the, not the candles, the story of the light in the temple and the oil is actually not historical. It's not found in any early sources. It only appears in rabbinic literature four or five hundred years, right, after the Maccabees cleansed the temple. And basically, the story of the Maccabees and the story that Jesus knew uh, when he walked the streets of Jerusalem it was a military victory. The, um, the Jewish people celebrated their victory over the Greeks and the, um, their ultimate um, establishment, yes, of a semi-independent, later a fully independent Jewish entity here in this country. And that, uh, you might say, that's, that's real story of the revolt uh, against the Greeks uh, is told in the, the book of Maccabees, or at least 1st Maccabees. The second, um, or, or what happens eventually along the way, is that uh, the, uh, the, story of the, the story of the revolt, the story of the five Maccabean brothers, Judas, Simon, yes, uh, Eliezer, and others, all of that is suppressed, and it's, you might say, it's removed from, the, from Jewish memory. And what takes its place is the miracle of the candles. In the story of the Maccabees, is, uh, or in, in, the, in the history of the Maccabees, you have, um, in the ancient sources, four books, or three books, were actually recorded the story of the revolt, yes, and uh, the reaction, no. And so, let's look at these for a moment. So, we have First Maccabees, which is in the Apocrypha, originally written in Hebrew, and uh, it is a it is an apology for the Hasmonean dynasty. It's explaining why the Jewish people at the time have kings and rulers who come from the Hasmonean, the Hasmonean family, and, and uh, we give them the nickname Maccabees. And why is it that while they're Levites, how is it possible for them to rule as kings when they don't come from the line of David? So this is, uh, you, you might say, a, a propaganda, an interesting propaganda exercise. And the emphasis of on 1st Maccabees is military might and strength and courage and bravery. And uh, it rarely mentions God. It's really a marvelous history about the power 
of the sword, yes? And then you have 2 Maccabees, which was written in Greek and probably written in the diaspora. It tells the story of the revolt, but it tells the story of the revolt in a slightly different way. Because while in 1 Maccabees, the revolt is all about those no good, nasty, low down Greeks who try to impose foreign, non-biblical ways on the Jewish people, yes? Second Maccabees tells a more complicated story. And we learn that there's a lot of internal dissension and a lot of division. And it's that division within the Jewish people here in Jerusalem that actually brings, um, brings a disaster. But there is deliverance and the emphasis is less on the might of the sword and more on God's miraculous intervention. And the way, one of the ways that the Lord um, intervenes on behalf of his people is thanks to the martyrdom, yes, of faithful Jews who refuse to give in, um, for example, by eating pork. And it's that martyrdom that moves God and brings about uh, salvation. Third Maccabees is neither here nor there. And fourth Maccabees is, a, you might say, is a commentary and a, and a greater or a deeper uh, description, deeper insights on martyrdom and uh, what it brings to a community. So here you have a tent, here you have uh, a very complicated story, and it has, you might say, two streams that run through it. They sometimes overlap, and they're sometimes totally separate. One stream is rebel, fight, yet the, the bravery of the few against the many, uh, a small group of uh, Jews who start a guerrilla war and end up uh, pulling down, at least in this country, the second uh, mightiest empire uh, in the world in which they live, the Seleucid Empire. And the other is about piety, prayer, fasting. Yes, the importance of being loyal to the Torah, enduring or the endurance of suffering and persecution and, uh, and the proper response, right, to persecution and suffering, uh, which may go as far as martyrdom. So these two, um, these, uh, these two themes, you might say, uh, you might, are, are somewhat in tension. And the Jewish people, after three revolts against Rome, Yes, the first revolt was in 66 to 70. The second revolt was, uh, took place in the diaspora, uh, 117, 118, and Egypt, Libya, Cyprus. The third revolt, the, the most, perhaps the most horrible of the three, was the revolt of Bar Kokhba, 132 to 135. All of these apparently took as a model the, the Maccabean revolt, and all three revolts had had uh, all three revolts against the Romans, which again were all disasters, yes, and brought great suffering on the Jewish people. Also had an eschatological edge, and that eschatology said we can speed up the redemption. We can hasten the messianic age. We can make it come faster, okay? We can, we can uh, by, what we, by what we're willing to do, uh, what, how we're willing to uh, commit ourselves, God will see our effort, God will see our commitment, 
and he, you might say, will step in to rescue us and to bring our efforts, you know, uh, to some kind of fruition. Yes, hastening the end, pushing the, the messianic clock forward through human activity. That, by the way, is not unknown in Christian history as well. And after, there's an American saying, three strikes and you're out. I don't know if you've heard that saying or you know it. Yeah, the, uh, the, the commentators who later become rabbis or the teachers of the Torah decide, well, this eschatology isn't working for us and we need to minimize uh, revol the revolt we need to minimize this, this way of eschatological thinking. And the first thing you do is you try to uh, remove, from, remove from your history, right, the whole story, the whole story of the Maccabean revolt. Yes, because it's dangerous. It's, it's a dangerous precedent. And the second thing you do is you change your eschatology. Instead of trying to hasten the end, yes, the, 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 you might say the Jewish way is going to be we will suffer patiently until the Messiah comes. We will try to do nothing, right, that will uh, force the end or bring the Messianic age quicker. It'll come in its time. And in the meantime, we have to suffer if necessary, and we have to wait patiently. That way of thinking, you might say pervaded, or prevailed even, most of Jewish history up until recently. In fact, up until when? Pardon? No, not 1948. But that's a good guess. 1967, when the students of, uh, of uh, Merkaz Harav Kuk, yes, decided that uh, the 1967 war between Israel and her Arab neighbors was a messianic sign, and uh, that now we need to take the initiative. So it's a return to the old eschatology. But what do you have in its place? Yes, in its place, you have the story of the candle, of the, I say candles, because that's what Jews light today at Hanukkah, of the miracle of the temple, the lights, the oil, the lights. The martyrdom, yeah, is not totally forgotten. And there are four places or so that it shows up in rabbinic literature. But the martyrdom of the, of the Jews during the time of the Maccabees, it doesn't even, all these stories are taken and put into a Roman context. So you can see that there's a suppression of history. And perhaps you can understand why. And the same tension, we'll find the same tension in Christian history. Because the story of Hanukkah, the story of the Maccabees is not forgotten in the slightest. So we know already in the fourth century, yes, is that in Jerusalem, and I'd like to put up, and Joseph, you can put up the next slide, okay? This is... Um, Let's go to the next one, too. Okay. So, in Jerusalem, in the fourth century, local Christians, yes, are commemorating or venerating a number of saints. Now, these aren't just Christian saints. These are figures from the Old Testament or from uh, the Apocrypha. And so in uh, a village just north of French Hill, 
on May the 1st, Christians um, are um, celebrating through in, in, in a mass and in, in some kind of divine service, Jeremiah, because Anatot is the village where he was from. And on the 10th of June, the prophet Zechariah and Elisha is on the 14th of June, Isaiah on the 6th of July, and yes, the, the, the martyrs from the time of the Maccabees, along with the five brothers, five Maccabean, five brothers who, uh, are, who are engaged in the revolt, they are commemorated, venerated on August the 1st. And apparently from Jerusalem, this custom of venerating uh, the Maccabees, it travels to places like Georgia and Armenia, and it ends up in Antioch, right? And uh, in Antioch, we are, by the fourth century, we have a lot of evidence, and Joseph, you can go to the next one, okay. Um, we have a lot of evidence that the Maccabean martyrs are uh, being used as models and uh, inspiration for the Christian community. Now, what's, I think, quite amazing um, in all of this, so while the Jewish people weren't interested in uh, remembering the Maccabees, and after all, the Jews virtually forgot, the Jewish people virtually forgot that there was a, that there was a first Maccabees, a second Maccabees, Yes, a book called Fourth Maccabees. They weren't interested uh, in any such literature. They weren't interested in Josephus, right? The early church preserved not only the Apocrypha, but they, they, they preserved um, um, a great deal of uh, Jewish literature, uh, including uh, Josephus. And uh, the Jewish people from the first century onward uh, decided uh, somewhat that they have all the history that they needed uh, in the Bible. And when prophecy ceased and the last of the prophets stopped prophesying, that seemed to be for them a cutoff point. And what became important, what became important for Jewish people, commentaries, yes, uh, and literature that uh, would try to um, explain the Torah. How should God's law, how should God's guidance, God's, how should God's uh, direction and instruction, how should that be carried, how should that be lived out uh, in, one's, in, uh, in one's life? And this, um, you might say, veneration of um, not only what we might call here Old Testament saints, but also this veneration of, um, of the Maccabees, especially the martyrs, was actually uh, quite unique. Because as we know, um, this story, uh, it's, a, it's quite uh, interesting. This story is that the martyrs are killed for refusing, refusing to eat pork. In 2nd Maccabees and 4th Maccabees, actually there's a story, there's a story of, uh, they're the same story, but uh, and it's been expanded in 4th Maccabees. There's a story of a mother, there's a story of a priest by the name of uh, Eliezer, um, and there's a story of a mother whose name we don't know, she has seven sons. Her seven sons it's, uh, are, for, are being forced by the Greeks, uh, by the Greeks 
to eat pork. They refuse to eat pork, and she urges them to stand fast and not to compromise. And she tells, she tells them by refusing to compromise and refusing to break God's law, you will receive a, what she calls a better resurrection, a phrase that we read, we read in uh, Hebrews 11, uh, 35. And so here you have the early church on August the 1st, they're starting to venerate a, a group who are actually keeping the Torah. Now here, by the fourth century, right, the Christian church has totally abolished the food laws, right? They're not important, and now we're accusing Jews of being, uh, at this point, being legalistic uh, or um, not, um, or adhering to something which uh, wrongly was understood uh, that uh, Christ had abolished. And yet, for their loyalty and their, re and their refusal to eat uh, forbidden food, these, um, this mother, her seven sons, and this elderly priest, right, are, um, are being honored with their own uh, special, their own special feast day. This spreads this custom, which came from Jerusalem and went to Antioch, very quickly spreads throughout the entire Christian world. It spreads like wildfire. And uh, someone once observed that only Christmas and Epiphany, yes, were more popular than this particular, uh, than this particular holiday. And so what was it about, right, the Maccabees, that they should have, um, you know, their own feast day? Again, we can, and a, a feast day that uh, takes root, takes strong root in a town like Antioch, where there was a lot of competition and um, you might say, some bad relationship or bad blood between Jews and Christians in this particular town. Yeah. Yeah. So what would it be that, why would there be um, Christians who are making Torah observant Jews look good? Yeah. And we know from whether it's Ambrose or Augustine uh, or others, uh, we know that um, whether well, it uh, could be in North Africa, could be in Italy, could be in Cappadocia, right? This becomes a fairly popular, uh, this becomes a very, very popular holiday. And um, let's go to the next one, Joseph. So here we have a, a man who um, does not win any awards for promoting Jewish-Christian relations, right? This is uh, St. John Chrysostom of, um, of Antioch. Uh, he had some very, very harsh things to say about the Jewish people, although we need to probably understand the context in which he said these things, and we need to be very careful um, how we understand uh, some of his criticism of the criticisms of the Jewish uh, Jewish people because he may have been uh, criticizing uh, Christians who were pretending to be Jews. Uh, we, uh, this is not the place to go into that. But in any event, he's uh, considered by many Christians and most Jews who know anything uh, about. His, um, his teaching to be a, an anti-Semite. But here's what he said about the martyrs, right? He said, uh, talking about, the, he gave a sermon. He gave a sermon about the year 380. And he gave two sermons, at least that two sermons that, that survived. He says, the bodies of the martyrs are precious because they have been sanctified, not by an angel, but by Christ himself. 
The presidents of athletic games strive to recruit young and vi uh, vigorous men for the pleasure of their spectators. Christ, however, places before our eyes seven young boys, their elderly mother and the old man, Eliezer, to contest in the most dreadful of matches. The martyrs are weak in their bodies, but strong in their faith and strengthened by the grace of God. They prevail easily over the, de over the devil. Especially admire admirable is the moder mo sorry, martyrdom of the elderly mother, who was taken first to the contest by the devil, but was left to witness the death of her sons before dying herself. The faithful must keep her as an example in their struggles against their own passion, right? So these martyrs, right, are being used, are being held up uh, as models, right, for the Christian community. It's, we're now at a time when martyrdom has come to an end, at least in many places throughout the empire. Um, of course, it will return with a vengeance uh, in the early Muslim period. And the Christian community, according to um, some, of its, uh, some of its leaders, you might say it's becoming lax. It's becoming uh, less than committed. And um, it needs heroes. It needs uh, examples. And the Maccabee martyr, the martyrs of these seven brothers, the mother and Eliezer, these Maccabean martyrs, right, they, they gave their lives even before the coming of Christ. So how much more should, should we be uh, uh, committed or how much more should we discipline ourselves or discipline our passions uh, as, they, uh, as they did? Now, that it happens in... Um, Antioch has generated a huge amount of, uh, you might say, scholarship to suggest that this uh, feast and this veneration of these martyrs was some scheme some, uh, to um, um, attack the Jewish people or to bring back those Christians who are spending a lot of time uh, in the synagogue, and um, there is a, a whole school of thought that believes that um, the Christians took this over from the Jews. They took up, they took the veneration of these martyrs uh, over from the Jewish people. Uh, there was a synagogue that somehow was connected with the bones or the relics. Of, of these uh, seven martyrs, nine martyrs, and uh, that this was destroyed and a church was built uh, on it, was built on the site. I don't, um, I don't buy it. I don't think it's very, I don't think it's very convincing. I think what is convincing is that the veneration of the dead or the veneration of holy people um, actually is something that the church uh, inherits from the Jewish people. I don't know if you realize that in the Second Temple period, yes, there is a place of pilgrimage in uh, what is the, in uh, Hebron, in Hebron. And um, Jewish people, the pilgrims, are going to visit that place uh, when they come, uh, well, they come from overseas, but those who are, are living here. Now, what place is that? Where do they go to visit? The Machpelah, right? The tombs of the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, yes, Sarah, and more. Now, how do we know they go to visit that place? 
in the Second Temple period. Why would I, I, I don't need literary evidence. Because Herod, did he not? He built quite an impressive tomb or quite an impressive building over their tomb, over their tombs. And he wouldn't have done so had it not been a place of pilgrimage or had not been a place of veneration. And we have rabbis who do talk about the fathers or the patriarchs, uh, the patriarchs being, uh, being venerated. And so the custom in one form or another came down to, uh, down to the early church. And um, it's not surprising that in Antioch, where, for, where, where Fourth Maccabees was written, and Antioch was the, the capital uh, of one time of the Seleucid Empire, that this would be the center or a center of, of, um, of veneration. Um, as I said, the custom of having services on August the 1st accompanied by processions, right, in honor of these uh, martyrs, spread very quickly throughout the East. It spread throughout the West. It uh, was popular, it was especially popular in places like Spain, uh, in places like um, Ireland. Okay, can I see the next slide? And it began to be reflected, for example, in Christian art. And so here we have a fourth century casket of a, of a wealthy Christian person. And I don't know if uh, the Bres Brescia is a town in northern Italy. Here's one of the most magnificent pieces of early Christian art. Uh, the casket um, has a... Um, is uh, a number of biblical scenes in the uh, carved uh, carved into the stone, and one of the scenes, if you look up top, here you have the seven brothers uh, who are being uh, tortured, and literally um, uh, the word that is used in Fourth Maccabees. And second Maccabees, with toward they're being roasted alive uh, in one way or another, or being put, put um, being burnt alive. And so here you have the seven brothers um, in the fire. Okay, and the next one, Joseph. Here's, for example, the seven sons. And because the mother doesn't have a name, she was given the name Solomon, Sol, Solomone. Um, and here's a church. This is a Byzantine style mosaic, uh, a Byzantine style image, um, or an image in the Byzantine tradition. And here's a church in Rome that is honoring the, uh, again, the martyrs. The emphasis, the emphasis in early Christian history is the martyrdom the martyrdom. Rarely are Christians in this period, in the first thousand years, ever thinking uh, about the, the military conquest, right, uh, that's found in First Maccabees. Okay? Let's go. So in the old Roman Catholic calendar of the, of the West, and uh, we could easily point this out and for Eastern, Eastern calendars. Um, is, there on, is there another slide to this, Joseph? Yeah, on, there you go. On August the 1st, um, and, and all uh, church calendars before 1969, I don't know if you can see, August the 1st, it says St. Peter's Chains, Okay, Commemor and commemoration of the Holy Maccabees, St. Peter's Chains. 
Uh, this was a feast day that remembered Peter's release from prison as described to us in Acts chapter 12. And it was uh, paired with um, the, um, the feast or the, festi the festival of the Holy Maccabees, okay? And the next slide. But, um, this, by the way, this feast day had, had, a, had a unique liturgy and uh, the colic, the, the one sentence prayer that would sum up the service uh, goes like this. O Lord, may the martyrdom of these brothers warm our hearts with joy, enliven our faith by an increase of virtue, and comfort us by the added number of intercessors we have in heaven. Okay? So here you have, you, you encounter, um, again, whether you agree with it or not, it's been a part of uh, it has been a part of church history that those who go before us pray for us. And um, in, uh, in light of the Reformation, some of, this, uh, some of this was clearly rejected, but still nonetheless, um, the main purpose is not that the, these seven, nine martyrs will pray for us, the main purpose is that they will serve as an example that they'll warm our hearts with joy and enliven our faith by an increase in virtue. Because if you read 2nd Maccabees or 4th Maccabees, when these um, uh, particular Jews are being forced to uh, apostatize or to, to break the commandments of the Torah, um, the ironic thing is that while on one hand the Maccabees are revolting or rebelling against Hellenization in Greek ways, but in 2nd and 4th Maccabees, part of the, the defense uh, that these martyrs make for themselves, um, it's, it's language and concepts that uh, any Greek philosopher or many citizens uh, educated Greek citizens of the uh, Greek speaking citizens of the Roman Empire um, or before would have been quite comfortable with right it's there's the, it's a very rationalistic um, it's a very rationalistic answer and um, it's you might say it's kind of religious common sense I'm not going to apostatize uh, I'm not going to break God's law and uh, a number of reasons are given, and I'm going to uh, endure, um, and I'm going to suffer if I need be, <clears throat> uh, in, um, so that virtue will overcome emotion, okay? So we can go to the next. And so <clears throat> what was the motivation, right? What was the motivation for this particular feast day? Well, first they were martyrs for the, the scripture, for the law of God, right? They refused to break a small commandment, um, but they thought was very important, uh, and certainly one that would have uh, been, you might say, uh, one that would have uh, been a, a violation of their identity. Second, um, the church always saw the seven brothers they have some kind of universal significance. And um, if they, these seven began to represent all the so-called saints of the Hebrew Bible, all those who were full of faith and he, as Hebrews 11 might say, looking for, you know, looking for something uh, beyond what they had encountered um, and looking as um, the early church would have understood actually looking for the Messiah. Um, also that they, they teach patience in the midst of surf suffering and uh, they're models of courage, right? Everybody, when they face hard times, we all need courage and therefore these, these seven uh, will uh, indeed help us to uh, 
um, uh, you might say, uh, not compromise in whatever situation that we might find ourselves. And finally, um, uh, uh, being an institution, the church, um, or churches both East and West appreciated the, the seven martyrs in particular, again, their mother and the priest that inspired them uh, because they defended tradition, right? Um, the, uh, a, a, biblical, uh, a biblical tradition. Now the feasts that we, um, the feasts that we um, no, um, are familiar with is dropped from the Roman Catholic calendar uh, in the West in 1969. There was calendar reform, basically because there were too many, uh, you might say too many saints, too many personalities, too many events on the calendar. It was a bit overwhelming. Um, I know the temptation is to think, oh, this was anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish, but 1969 is seven years after Vatican II. And that's when the church has decided, at least the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church, that they're going to be reconciled to the Jewish people. So the motivation can't be um, in any way, um, is not, can't be seen in any way as being uh, anti-Semitic. And it is still on the calendar of many Eastern churches. And uh, by the way, it is still celebrated today amongst local Catholics on August the 1st, Catholics um, in Israel, and whether it's Jerusalem or Beersheba or Jaffa, this is, this is still remains a feast day. And um, there is one other, by the way, there is one other holiday. There is one, now only one holiday or one feast day or, or one day of commemoration. That's a better way of putting it. Uh, that uh, remains on the calendar and it commemorates um, a group of people who were not Christians. And uh, we celebrate it um, just a few days after Christmas. Anyone have an idea what that is? And it's quite relevant for us today. What would that be? It's very relevant for us. Everybody, every Christian should commemorate this, commemorate this special day. It's the Holy Innocents. It remembers Herod killing babies in Bethlehem, right? And in light of the high rate of abortion that we have around the world, right? Poverty, disease, and war, where children are sometimes the chief victims, and all of this, I think it's a good, I think it's a good reminder. Um, and a few days after commemorating the, the death of the, whole, of the Holy Innocents, what does the church commemorate on January the 1st? Eight days after Christmas, circumcision. So the brief meal of Jesus. And 40 days after Christmas, what's commemorated? The presentation of Jesus in the temple. Now, how many, again, in a Protestant tradition, do we ever th think about or honoring or celebrating that Jesus is presented in the temple? Do we, ever, do we ever, quote unquote, celebrate his circumcision? I think many of us have this idea. Yeah, Jesus is the universal savior. And, um, and by the way, he's Jewish. No, it's because he's the Jewish Messiah that he's the universal savior. I think we have sometimes the, the order wrong. Okay? All right. So 
This brings us to a trickier subject, um, and uh, these, these martyrs, like all good saints, what comes with the, what comes with the saints? Relics, okay, so let's see. So the story goes, and I can't tell you if it's true or not, the story goes is that from Antioch, the bones of the martyrs uh, went to Constantinople and eventually to Rome, and uh, they finally ended up in, a, in Cologne, and the uh, Church of St. Andrews in Cologne in 1164. And uh, this is a um, reliquary, a place where relics are kept. Uh, the bones of the um, the bones of the saints, and um, these relics, um, right, become popular in the fifth, sixth, and seventh centuries. It has very little to do you know, with uh, paganism or the pagan world. But there was a great need in uh, uh, Mediterranean society at that time, and the relics help Christians, and we can be critical of this if we want, but the relics help Christians to have a, you might say, uh, a closer connection uh, with God. By connecting with the saint, Right? by connecting with someone who had an exemplary life or someone who you can model your life after a, um, a, you know, as an example or as some kind of, uh, as some kind of, of uh, mentor, it, uh, you might say, close the gap or close the distance, yes, between you and God. Because many people have this feeling you know, that either God may be ignoring me or God may be busy or God is sitting on his throne with the Messiah, et cetera, et cetera. And there's something of quite a, um, quite a large, quite a large uh, uh, gap, yeah. And uh, in some way, saints and um, saints and martyrs in particular Right, fill that, um, fill that un understanding. Um, now, all of this is largely about. It's about martyrdom. It is Second Maccabees and Fourth Maccabees. All of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but in the 11th century, there's a change, and the emphasis in the Christian world is going to switch from martyrdom and the examples of these martyrs, and it's now going to be, the focus will uh, end up on first Maccabees, okay? Let's have the next one. So, the Crusades. Uh, along come the Crusades, and um, Pope Urban II and others who are motivating European Christians to go to the Holy Land, right, in the 1090s and beyond. Yes, they're going to use, actually, they're going to use biblical examples. They're going to talk about Joshua, or they're going to talk about Moses, Moses fighting the Amalekites, Joshua fighting the Canaanites. But uh, what's going to become quite important for them, yeah, their role model is going to be Judas Maccabeus, right? It's going to be the Maccabees uh, and the way that they conquered. And the Maccabees, of course, had to conquer Jerusalem, and they had to cleanse the temple. And this is what the Pope and the preachers of the crusade, this is what they're going to use as, uh, as, as motivation. Now don't forget, for those who could read, right, the, the, the Jerome and others, they translated 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees. Yes, it was in the Vulgate. And so those who read the Bible, you know, took, uh, could take inspiration 
from uh, the story of the Maccabean revolt. And they, the call was go and liberate Jerusalem and liberate the temple just like Judas or Judah, yes, uh, did uh, a thousand years before. And uh, that becomes, that certainly becomes uh, the model. And when the first king of Jerusalem dies, King Baldwin, and he's buried in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it's interesting what they write on his grave. They write, Judas Maccabeus, right? He's the Crusaders are the new Maccabees. Who knows anything about the Teutonic Knights in, uh, in the Baltic area, in Lithuania, and in Estonia, and Northern Poland, right? The Teutonic Knights, they were a brotherhood of monks. They weren't priests, but they, they took an oath of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and they were going to fight the infidel. And uh, that corner of Europe was just about the last, the, the last area to become, become Christian. And uh, these Teutonic Knights, they, again, they took as their model for, um, for their battles with non-Christian warlords or non-Christian kings. They took, as their, they took as their model the Maccabees, right? Again, first Maccabees becomes, um, uh, becomes uh, the inspiration. Um, and so, again there's, this, again, there's this tension in the story, and there's a, there's a radical shift. The picture that's up here is um, one of the saddest events in Jewish-Christian relations, and maybe one of the saddest events um, in uh, maybe Christian history, when the Crusaders were massing and beginning to march towards the Holy Land, uh, they were joined by you, what you might call a mixed multitude. Um, they were uh, not perhaps, uh, not especially the Knights themselves, but those who kind of came along after them. And as they began to march through France, and they began to march through Germany. Again, they saw themselves as the Maccabees going to liberate the temple. On the way, especially in the area of the Rhineland, the Rhine Valley, they encountered very prosperous Jewish communities. And uh, what happens is clear. How it happens and why it happens isn't quite so clear. But there is large-scale genocide or murder, yes, uh, of, of Jews. Um, some of the early crusade, the chroniclers of, the, of this um, Jerusalem march, you might call it, said it was done for money, not for religious reasons. Others talked about uh, the... the um, the, the mob trying to force Jews to be baptized. And you can see from this that there's some horrible, horrible things that happen. So much so that uh, even as moderns who are a thousand years away from the events, uh, we have a hard time uh, comprehending this. And uh, in particular, uh, amongst Jews, there was a, um, a very, very uh, strong, strong reaction. Certainly maybe one of fear, and maybe there was some hysteria involved, mass hysteria involved, because you had many Jews who refused to be forcibly baptized or forcibly converted, which, by the way, was, was 
against the canons of the church, right? Never in history did the church want to forcibly baptize someone. Um, you, you had to come and do this willingly, not to do it under duress. But um, then comes a Jewish reaction that's also not found in the Torah because what you're going to have is you're gonna have murder, you're gonna have women who murder their children. <clears throat> and it has echoes of the story of the mother and the seven sons, yeah, who told her sons don't compromise and she watched one after another, yeah, tortured, okay? And she assured them that there was going to be eternal life. And further, she assured them that their, their sacrifice will bring cleansing and purification, yes, for the sins of the nation. Which, by the, which, by the way, is some of the roots of the, uh, of the, the theology of atonement uh, in the New Testament. And so here's one story. The story is about a Rachel, a Rachel. She's the daughter of Isaac bar Asher and the wife of uh, Rabbi Judah. She has four children, and she says, don't pity them either. Least the uncircumcised come, catch them alive, and the children shall live in their error, the error of Christianity, right? And um, it's a story of um, this mother uh, of the children. She saw a knife, she cried out to God, uh, she beat her chest, beat, beat her face, um, and uh, then she went to, uh, she found her son Aaron, um, or son Isaac, right, and his brother Aaron, and uh, she slew them. Uh, he was young and pleasant, it says. This is from a, a Hebrew source. And the mother opened her arms to receive their blood and received the blood in the edges of her garment rather than in the blood basins. The boy Aaron, when he saw his brother slain, was shouting, Mummy, mummy, don't slay me. And he went and hid under a chest. She still had two daughters, Bella and Madrona, uh, who were at home, beautiful virgins. Um, and the girls took the knife and sharpened it so they would not have any blemish and extended their necks and she sacrificed them to the Lord of hosts. Um, and it goes on like this. So here you have this story of 2nd Maccabees and 4th Maccabees, which again is found in a kind of an unusual uh, way, in a, in a, a little bit of a non-historical way. It's found in the Talmud. It's found more, uh, at least three times in the Talmud and once in uh, a, um, in Midrashic literature, and she's following, you might say, that example. And just a few years later, you have uh, Gregory, who's the abbot now of the Dome of the Rock, which has been turned into a monastery. It's called the Temple of the Lord. And he takes the same story, and he's going to write about um, these, the mother, the seven brothers, but he's going to understand these seven brothers, these are gonna be the crusaders, right? Who died, right? You know, liberating, uh, liberating the Holy Land. So he writes this, he writes this in Latin. And so we come back to, we come back to the tension, right? That's there in the beginning. And we come back to the temptation that people will often take in every age. They'll take their po political or religious views and hang them on historical events, which becomes really, really dangerous, right? Here are the Crusaders, you know, they, they see an analogy. They're like the Maccabees. Well, there's nothing like the Maccabees, but uh, there, uh, there are many, contradictions in that analogy. And here you have a woman, a Jewish woman, yes, in the year 1095, 
And what is today France, right, who's also going to um, uh, protect your children from being forcibly baptized or forcibly converted. And if I'm not mistaken, most of those who are forced, so-called quote-unquote forcibly converted were eventually allowed by the church or by the secular authorities uh, to return to Judaism. Because baptism should never be under, again, should never be under duress. Um, so the tension in Christian, the tension in, in, in the Christian world is the same tension that you had have in the Jewish world. Uh, the Jewish people rediscovered First Maccabees, and that was done under the influence of the Zionist movement. Yes, they began to appropriate uh, First Maccabees and began to, um, as the state was being formed, look for military heroes um, and for uh, Jewish figures from the past that could be emulated, yes, for their bravery, for their courage, um, et cetera, et cetera. The religious authorities, yes, wanted to suppress that, right, because um, it can be dangerous and end up having dangerous consequences. And as we can see in the history of history of the church, although we've only sketched um, we've only sketched uh, a very minimalistic picture. You can see that it can be positive, it can be encouraging, it can um, uh, cause Christians to um, to f uh, refocus on commitment, uh, again, to be courageous in uh, the face of uh, um, the surrounding culture, which wants them to compromise. But it also can be used in a very, very dangerous and negative way uh, as well. But let's end with something positive, if we can do so. So, um, the story of the, uh, of the Maccabees is um, also one in which um, there's some quite beautiful art uh, inspired by, by not only the, 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 the military campaigns, but also by the, the, uh, the, uh, the martyrdoms as well. But of course, nothing is more famous than Handel's, yes, oratorio on Judas Maccabeus. And um, in 1746, uh, Handel wrote, or they uh, in English, a, uh, the story of the Maccabees. It includes very appropriately first Maccabees and second Maccabees is woven in to the librato. And um, all of Handel's sacred oratorios, right, are virtually all of them, with, one, with a half an exception, all of them are Old Testament based. They either come from the Old Testament or they come from the Apocrypha, right? Those seven books, seven biblical books that are uh, in dispute between um, between Jews and uh, between between Christians, rather not between Jews and Christians, but between between Christians themselves, and so I don't know if it's possible, but there is one melody that comes from this oratorio that's quite popular, and if Joseph is uh, the 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 wonder king that we all think he is, um, he's going to play it for us. Afterwards, just a minute, okay? Afterwards, we will have questions, if there are any. What, why do I say that all, his, all of them are old? Old Testament days, the Messiah is um, half of it comes from the New Testament, right? The first half is 
is from the, from the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. Sing it to you, which is which is pretty bad. Maybe I'll whistle it. Joseph, you want another minute? We can do it. Okay, so l let's have questions, and then we'll end with the with the melody that you all know. Any questions, comments, criticisms, is issues? To go back to the first point, yeah? We're not divorced totally from our Jewish roots, right? For good or for bad. We absorb the story of, of uh, we absorbed the story of the Maccabees. We don't have a holiday called Hanukkah, all right? But uh, it certainly played an influential role um, throughout, um, throughout church history. It did go into decline somewhat as the calendar, uh, calendars of uh, all churches became um, Uh, brought here uh, in a way to seduce them yeah to to join the one world global community right get with the program 
Yeah, get iChat, Facebook, iTunes, you know, Twitter. Well, maybe we don't have Twitter anymore after you know who took it over, right? Instagram. Don't be, don't be a barbarian any longer. Give up those old ways and come and join us. And so that, that's, a, that's a challenge that um, uh, presents itself to the Jewish people. And um, one of the ways that they're going to respond is by a revolt. That's, and that revolt, by the way, is um, the revolt of the Maccabees and the, was influenced by Phineas. Phineas, who we read about in the book of Numbers, was called zealous for the Lord. And later, at least in the first revolt, the, the, the first Jewish revolt against Rome that leads to the destruction of the temple, what's their model? The model is the Maccabees. And if the Maccabees can do it, we can do it too, right? And the, the only problem was there's a very big difference between the Seleucid Empire or the Greeks that were, the Maccabees were fighting and the Roman Empire that uh, was being um, fought yeah, at a, um, in the year 66 AD. There's a radical difference. So that's, that's what I would say. Yeah, yeah. Doing what? Well, they were they were complicated. You had you know old ladies and that screen that was very prolific. Uh huh. <clears throat> okay, so Mike's Mike. Okay, here's a here's a question. There are two Zionist movements. One was sort of pacifistic, meaning uh, the old uh, Mapai, the old Labor Party that was trying to exercise some sort of self. Um, restraint, um, and then there was uh, groups uh, such as Beitar and uh, the Stern Gang, and they were a lot more active and a lot more militant. I would say that all forms of Zionism, secular, religious, uh, are in the stream of hastening the end, okay? even if you're secular. Yes, you're, uh, I'm not critical or uncritical of this. I'm just saying it is, I'm just stating it as. I'm st- both yes, there's a messianic vision. Could be a secular messianic vision, could be a religious messianic vision. And by the way, here's the problem. The problem is that secular Zionism, in order to motivate the Jewish masses, who, by the way, before World War II were never convinced, um, there was never a majority of Jews before the Second World War who were convinced of the Zionist project. So how do you motivate them? You use very, very emotionally messianic, messianically charged language. You talk about coming on Aliyah. We think of Aliyah as just making, immigrating to Israel. But Aliyah has a whole messy, you're going to come up to Jerusalem in the Messianic age. And you're going to um, use the Hebrew language, right? You're reviving the Hebrew language, which is very powerful. Or you're going to give money to the, um, like the, the Karen Kayemet, right? The Karen, what is the Karen Kayemet? The Karen Kayemet is your heavenly bank account. Right, that you store money in when you give. All of these terms, which are very religious, yes, the secular Zionist Jews use them in a secular way, but they now permeate the culture, right? The idea of geula, redemption, right? Taking Jerusalem or the redemption of the Jewish people or a miracle of Israel. And then one or two generations later, Along come 
another um, yeah, wave of, of young Jews. And uh, they're kind of religious, not as secular as, as, as uh, not the kind of the same, uh, there's not the same secularism here now that there was 75 years ago. And they hear all these terms and they take them, they take them at, uh, at face value. Meaning they don't take them in a secular way, they take them in a religious way. And this is the same problem that happened in Pakistan. In Pakistan, you had a bunch of secular Muslims who said, we need to separate from India. We need an Islamic state. And these Muslims who led the, the, the great split in the creation of Pakistan, these, these leaders, uh, you would sit around and drink whiskey and, and were very, very, very secular. But now there's a whole generation of Muslims, right, who have grown up, who take the, the, uh, the definition of Pakistan that's been given to them as an Islamic state. They take it very seriously. So you have to be very careful when you play with language. It can have really, really serious implications. Yeah? Are we, are we finished? All right, here we go.
Someone asked me about, um, well, Protestants don't read First and Second Maccabees, and we don't. Although you have to know that the, the Reformers, you know, people like Luther and Calvin and Cramner, they all had uh, kind of a soft spot for, for this literature, uh, the Apocrypha, but they weren't quite sure it was, they really weren't quite sure if it was inspired scripture. So they left it in, they left it in the Bible. And um, Luther himself was convinced that First Maccabees was absolutely inspired and it had to be in the canon to explain Daniel. Uh, although he had no time for Second Maccabees. Why would he have no time for Second Maccabees? What would disturb him about Second Maccabees? Second Maccabees, you have Judah saying we should pray for the dead. Not to the dead, which, but for the dead. And we should offer a sacrifice for them. Okay, so this caused some consternation. But still, uh, Wesley and others, you know, all thought that these books were, uh, they thought the Apocrypha was legitimate. And um, almost all Bibles printed in English up until the 1830s had the Apocrypha in a section in the middle. And then in Britain, there was a huge, huge um, outcry against Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholicism and against the Irish. And uh, because of that, you might say hostility, uh, the Bible Society stopped printing the King James Bible with the Apocrypha, which included First and Second Maccabees. And uh, so consequently, um, it has been left out of our, most of our Bibles uh, to this day. Okay. I think that answers, I hope that answers that question. Okay, well, thank you for coming. And um, I, I, I um, hope that when you have your jelly donuts and you spin your dreidel and uh, you'll light your, uh, your Hanukkah, that uh, you'll remember that for better, or for better and for worse, that uh, this certainly was not uh, swept aside and forgotten uh, in the history, in the history of the church. Okay, good night.